If you listen carefully, at the end, you'll be someone else. The plane plummeted abruptly, a sudden descent of about ten feet that would have been tolerable in a standard commercial aircraft, Grant mused. However, within the confines of this military cargo plane, the unexpected jolt felt painful. Throughout this mission, Grant found his fundamental beliefs about the world and human existence shaken to their core he became firmly persuaded that the boundaries of reality stretched well beyond conventional comprehension. There existed more to this planet and beyond than anyone had dared to imagine. Unfamiliar with Air Force rides? Dr. Hemmer, seated across from Grant, said, grinning. What's your project? Shifting in his seat, Grant replied, I'm researching if there's body fluid, and if there is, how it gets around them. As he was speaking, he kicked himself, realizing he was, perhaps, overzealous in maintaining his cover. And you, Grant added swiftly, attempting to redirect the focus away from him. You know we cannot discuss our projects. I'm surprised you shared yours with us. Dr. Hemmer remarked, eyeing Grant with a hint of suspicion, a sentiment mirrored by Dr. Reagan, seated at his side. The military security guard, a few seats down the cargo hold, also shifted attention toward Grant. He had heard Grant volunteered to accompany this flight as it was about to leave, and the explanation he gave wasn't really explored or questioned. Grant skillfully maintained his cover as he navigated the Roswell base, commonly known as Area 51, observing and gathering as much information as possible. He had been stupid in exposing himself on the way to Hangar 18, where apparently the most top secret projects were being carried out. The plane plunged again, further this time, and a warning buzzer started to sound. A crate in the cargo hold began to glow blue, the light growing in intensity. All attention moved to the crate. Doctors Hemmer and Reagan swiftly unfastened themselves, hastening towards it. Grant experienced a peculiar deja vu. He recognized the shade of blue light, but couldn't pinpoint where. His mind went blank, while an odd sensation coursed through his body. What's your take? Dr. Reagan shouted above the buzzer's noise. I don't know, Dr. Hemmer replied, reaching out to touch the edge of the light. In an instant, a blinding flash occurred, hurling him backward. The plane leveled, the buzzer ceased, and the once vibrant blue light began to fade. Dr. Reagan rushed to Dr. Hemmer's side. I'm okay, I'm okay reassured Dr. Himmer. Interesting. That felt just like an electrical shock. Grant, while making his mind back, unbuckled himself. Let's check to see if the pilots registered anything, he suggested. In truth, he wanted to discern their location, as no one had explained Hangar 18's whereabouts. The guard near the cockpit rose to intervene. I must ensure their instruments didn't detect anything. It's important, Grant insisted. I agree, Dr. Hemmer chimed in, recovering from the floor. Allow him through, please. The guard, showing a hint of uncertainty, opened the door, allowing Grant to step through. He could see the runway ahead. The captain, unwavering, kept his focus on flying, not bothering to turn his head. The landing was evidently imminent. The co-pilot turned, frowning. What the heck, he exclaimed. We're about to land. What are you doing? We just experienced an incident in the hold, 
Did your instruments pick up anything? Grant explained, peering through the windscreen to gauge their position. The captain spoke. Nothing. No time left. Fold down the seat on your right and strap yourself in. Grant quickly did as he was told and had a perfect vision of the landing. Once the plane landed, a guard came up to the scientists. Follow me, he ordered, leading the way down the ramp. Grant and the two doctors followed. Upon reaching the tarmac, the guard snapped to attention and saluted. Doctors Hemmer, Reagan, and Rolf, sir, he barked at another man, his rank displayed prominently on his shoulders. Grant recognized him as General Curtis. The general looked each doctor in the eye. Follow me, gentlemen, he said, and climbed into a jeep. The jeep sped across the tarmac, weaving through the buildings encircling the airstrip, and finally screeched to a halt in front of a small door leading to a colossal stainless steel hangar. Exiting the jeep, General Curtis headed for the door. This way, he instructed, beckoning over his shoulder. Grant's initial impression of the hangar, upon stepping inside, was defined by the subdued lighting and an eerie quietness. No sounds echoed within. Through the low light, he could just make out the first of what seemed to be a series of isolated units, each sealed off from the others by narrow passages. Overhead these units, a system of cables and pulleys ran off into the distance of this huge hangar. The crates they had transported were suspended by hooks on these cables, navigating the network. The top of some of the units swung open to allow crates to be lowered in. General Curtis took the middle passage in a row of eight large units, which Grant thought to be temporary structures made of plasterboard. He stealthily reached out and touched one. It was a solid material which he couldn't identify. The general snorted. Nothing in sight will be familiar or identifiable to you, doctor. Just stick to the reason you're here much safer for you. In silence, Grant continued to trail General Curtis closely. There was still a need to observe and gather information for old man Hoover. He had to be more cautious. The general navigated through a labyrinth of corridors and units. Finally, they halted outside a door. The general opened it. This one's for you, Dr. Hemmer. Grant attempted to peer inside, but a panel about a meter into the room acted as a screen, obstructing any view of the interior. You are a curious man, Dr. Roth. Be careful your curiosity doesn't land you in trouble, young man. Grant acknowledged that this reconnaissance wouldn't be as straightforward as it was in Roswell. There, many rooms and units had windows with one-way glass enabling safe observation of experiments from the outside. He had seen numerous peculiar objects, fragments and parts of something unfamiliar, possibly debris from a space vehicle, given the unknown materials. These objects were undergoing a multitude of tests. Grant had also observed analogous tests on what appeared to be small bodies in Roswell. Some were undergoing dissection, but he had stumbled upon a room where others were suspended inside glass tanks. However, those bodies were moving with wide open, watchful black eyes. Grant wasn't sure who was observing whom. The scientists walking around the room with various equipment and notepads, or the inhabitants of the tanks. The life forms were attentively watching every action and often moved their heads to look at each other as if communicating. Panic and fear rose in Grant when, unexpectedly, all beings in the tanks turned to face him. Grant was convinced he was behind one-way glass. If they could perceive or sense him through the glass, what other capabilities did they possess? Hastening away from the window, 
Grant entered an adjacent office, closing the door behind him. He took a few deep breaths. Fortunately, the office was empty. The telephone rested on the desk, and Grant swiftly dialed five numbers. The response was immediate. Where the heck have you been? No time to explain, replied Grant. Tell the old man. There are beings here like I've never seen before. Some alive. The door handle turned, prompting Grant to swiftly replace the receiver. He then pretended to browse the shelves behind the desk, as if searching for something. An officer entered and halted. What are you doing here? he asked. Assuming the guise of a technical expert, Grant began. I'm in pursuit of empirical data concerning the entities in the adjacent sector. The fractal geometry of their genetic sequences, coupled with the differential equations governing their cellular processes, could potentially unveil the mysteries of their origin and... I don't need a science class. No reports here. Get out, the officer interrupted, ushering Grant towards the exit. Grant was jolted back to the present as Dr. Himmer vanished into his designated unit and General Curtis commanded, Let's move, guiding them to another unit. Once again, the general accessed the door with a swipe of a card. This one is yours, Dr. Reagan, he said. The doctor entered and disappeared inside. After closing the door and swiping his card once more, the general stated, Right, Dr. Roth, the special room for you. Come. They briskly began walking. Concerned that his cover might have been compromised, Grant inquired. The special room, General? And there you go again, triggering my gut suspicions. Firstly, you know my rank, and then, as clever as your record says you are, You cannot put together that the special room might be the blue room. I have my eyes on you, Doc. Trust me. By the end of his diatribe, they had arrived at a unit larger than the others, positioned near the center of the hangar, Grant observed. Numerous cables dangled overhead, some swinging with large hooks attached. Yes, Dr. Roth, your equipment is quite large and new arrived just before you, and hopefully all ready for your use, said the general, opening the door. That's good news, General, Grant replied, suspecting General Curtis had mistaken him for another scientist slated to arrive later. To a military man, perhaps all scientists look the same. However, the fact that Grant's cover ID might belong to a real person loomed in his mind. His handler's directive had been clear. Get in, get as much info as you can, and get out. Grant had interpreted it as one of his usual missions, but the realization that he may be standing for a real person who could show up at any moment heightened the risk. The general escorted Grant into the room gesturing around the screening panel. Just as you requested, Dr. Roth, Phillips, Smithy, Veldy, and Agapov. He introduced, pointing to the men and the lone lady engrossed in the equipment. Are you ready to go? General Curtis asked these four. Very almost, replied Agapov, the only woman, who had a heavy Russian accent. Then I'll leave you here. The general declared and exited the room, the sound of the door locking, echoing behind him. Grant looked around the large space. Along the walls were tanks with the short, gray, living beings floating inside, just like the ones at Roswell. Simultaneously, they all turned to fixate their gaze on Grant. Instead of feeling threatened or scared, as he had in Roswell, This time he felt comfortable and safe, for some reason. Abruptly, part of the roof swung open and two crates were being lowered into the room. 
Phillips and Smithy ran to grab two flat trolleys leaning against the wall and guided the descending crates to them. Grant's eyes were drawn back to the tanks, and while the others were busy, he walked to one as the alien inside watched him. For a brief moment, they stood in a silent exchange, the alien's gaze blankly meeting Grant's. Then he reached out and put his hand flat against the tank, feeling its coolness. He nearly jumped back as the alien also raised his arm and placed his three large fingers against the inside wall right beside Grant's hand. Grant felt a tingling running up his arm and had a flashback vision. He was a child, maybe two or three years old. These same beings were standing on the lawn of his house in the middle of the night, glowing with a soft blue light. He saw himself innocently reaching out his hand, just like he did now, and the alien reciprocating. As they touched, Grant remembered the same tingling running up his arm as a child. The scene dissolved, and from the corner of his eye, Grant observed the alien retracting its arm inside the tube. Puzzled, he dropped his hand, staring at his newfound friend. An unexplainable and rare sensation enveloped him, as if he were an open book to that being. Dragging his eyes away, Grant surveyed the rest of the room. Positioned through the center were operating theater tables with straps, each encircled by various types of equipment. Two of these tables held small gray bodies, both unmoving, with closed eyes. Velde and Agapov were engrossed in their work on one of these inert bodies, linking it to the new, sizable machine. They then turned to Grant. Okay, Dr. Roth, over to you. I believe everything's ready. Veldi said with a distinct German accent. For the first time, Grant was being drawn into the activities. In Roswell, he had roamed freely, carrying a clipboard, an observer in the background, with no one particularly curious about him. He had been driven in, set up with an ID and clearance by the FBI, and his credentials had allowed him to move unrestricted around the base and on the flight. This time was different. Time to get out. Well, Dr. Verdi inquired, is there something missing or wrong? Without a moment's hesitation, Grant sprinted toward the recently arrived crates. Leaping onto one, he propelled himself into the air and succeeded in grabbing the rising hook. Scaling the cable, he ascended to the network of cables he had noticed when entering the hangar. The scientists stood frozen in shock, and both crates, along with the aliens and the tanks, started to emit a blue glow. Veldi was the first to recover, dashing to a button set in a box on the wall. Net! screamed Agapov. Don't! Veldi ignored her and smashed the glass at the front of the box, pushing on the red button with all his might. The siren blared, its warning pitch rising. Simultaneously, all the aliens in the tanks glowed brighter, and blue lightning bolts shot from one to another. Chaos erupted in the blue room. From where Grant was, he could see the same thing starting to spread through the hangar, Blue light emanated from many units, and bolts of blue lightning streaked through the air. Guards, responding to the siren, rushed toward the blue room, only to hit the floor as the lightning bolts continued to fly. Nit! screamed Agapov again. Turn off the siren! Silence there must be! Stop the noise! All the chaos gave Grant time to scramble across the cable network towards the hangar entrance. There was no way out on the roof. He would have to get out the way he came in, through the front door. He moved at an even faster pace to position himself above the open space at the front of the hangar, ahead of all the units. Suddenly, the siren ceased, 
and the lightning bolts halted, the bright blue lights gradually fading. Then shots echoed through the hangar. Grant was sure he had been spotted. Acting swiftly, he tore off his white coat, leaped at one of the cables descending to a crate on the floor, wrapped the coat around it, and clung to it tightly, sliding down to the crate. From there, he jumped and seized one of the nearby scientists. Cease fire, the order rang out from General Curtis as he appeared around the corner of the units. Come on, Ruff, or whatever your name is. You're not going to get out of here. You are surrounded, he declared. Grant kept moving toward the door, dragging the scientist with him. My snipers can shoot you, the general said pointing to the men appearing on top of the first row of units. But I'd rather we talk about this, huh? Come on, let the man go. Grant reached the door, stepped through with the scientist, and closed it behind him. As he turned, he found himself facing a semicircle of soldiers, all with their guns leveled at him. Swiftly, he swung the scientist around to cover himself. This was getting tricky. He knew he didn't have long before the general would breach the door. From nowhere, a helicopter appeared, swooping in with guns firing at the ground around the soldiers. They ran for cover, firing back at the helicopter as they did so. Grant understood help had arrived. He released the scientists, who, to his surprise, also sprinted towards the rope ladder hanging from the helicopter. Both jumped on it at the same time, one on either side, as it was retracted into the helicopter, which swiftly swung away from the hangar. As he was pulled inside, Grant realized this was a Soviet helicopter. Guns were pointing at him. Whoa, guys, whoa, let's talk, he shouted over the noise, waving his hands in front of him. I can help you get out. We got in, we got out. Easy, no? Replied the scientist, who Grant realized must be a spy. Grant marveled at how a Soviet armed craft could infiltrate this far across America without detection. You somehow got in, but you won't get out. My guys are tracking me and waiting for my contact. The scientist spy pondered for a moment. Okay, we let you live. You clear us a safe path out, huh? Okay, shouted Grant. Let me talk to the air command. The scientist spy handed him a headset, which Grant set to a coded channel. He spoke some codes and then gave coordinates to the Soviet spy. We drop you there, asked the Soviet spy. Yes, replied Grant. It didn't take long before they flew around a deserted area with a circle lit by torches. The helicopter hovered to one side, and the rope ladder was dropped out of the cabin. Grant descended, offering a salute to the spy. Returning the salute, the spy remarked, The great Orvicia will help us leave America, too, next time. Once Grant had landed on the ground, a jeep pulled up next to him, and he jumped in. The driver grabbed his hand in greeting. As the helicopter swung away from them and gained height, they watched it for a few seconds until a flame appeared from the other side, hurtling towards the helicopter, which exploded into a ball of fire. Now, that's what I call a flaming safe path out, said Grant. His handler laughed. And now we'll go start a full debrief after a flaming successful mission. He patted Grant on the back with one hand while steering the jeep with the other. And the boss will be joining us, he added, as he headed towards a plane waiting at the end of a grass runway. Oh, great, exclaimed Grant. He's not going to believe what I have to tell him. <laughs>